Ready for the word this morning. It's good to be back in the saddle again, you know. I mean, it's like, it's, I, I, like I like having babies, and I like being gone up to the hospital and being with my wife and, and all that, but I missed preaching the word last week as well, and so it's, it's, it's good to be here. And it's kind of funny, you know, last week, in preparation for last weekend's message, honestly, in four and a half years of being a lead pastor, I have never worked harder on preparing a message than the message I had prepared for last week. I mean, I worked and worked. I probably wrote three full-length messages in trying to just consolidate it to one message last week. It was like really hard work. And so I just kind of figured, you know, like, hey, I'm just... Okay, baby came, Pastor Tim filled in. I just figured, wow, we're just going to take that message and carry it over to this week. Nope, no, 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 God has different plans than that. So that one that I worked so hard on, probably all that work was for nothing. I'm just going to write a book someday, like Messages God Didn't Let Me Preach or something like that. It's probably, probably a dumb book, I know, but, you know, <laughs> but I'll like it. I'll buy it. I'll buy my own book. How about that? So that being said, we're actually going back to the book of Acts, where we've been spending a lot of time this summer, and... And this week and the weeks to come, we're going to be launching into a multi-week series called Spirit-Led. Spirit-Led. And what we're really going to be talking about this is the importance of being led by the Spirit in our lives. That God has called us to live Spirit-Led lives. And really, that's the, that's the bottom line of this series. Let's just start this series with the, the bottom line. It's this. God wants you, God wants me to live a Spirit-Led life. If you're a child of God, how many, are, how many would say I'm a child of God? Okay. If you're a child of God, then that is God's plan for you, to be spirit-led. In fact, Romans 8.14 says this. Paul writes, For all who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. Let me read that again. For all who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. And so Paul says, listen, if you're a child of God, if you're a son of God, one of the qualifications of that is this, that you are a spirit-led individual. Now, it's interesting, that phrase, are being led, okay? The Greek word for that phrase, are being led, is a word, it's agonitai, A-G-O-N-T-A-I, agonitai, okay? And like so many Greek words, the, the, the word agonitai, it paints this picture that I feel like the English just misses out on, okay? Because the Greek is just such an expressive language. And so there's this picture that, that's, that's painted when, when, when a Greek person hears that word, agonitai, the image that would come to their mind is this. It would be a man who has sight leading a blind man. Okay, that's the imagery that's tied into that word. Actually, I love the fact that we did that song, Kat, this morning, because, because the, the first few uh, lyrics of that song very much allude to that right there, right? That I, 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 I'm, I don't know where I'm going, right? It's that imagery of just kind of walking out blindly, but I'm being led, right? And so agonitai, that word, are being led, it's that imagery of a, of, of a blind man being led by somebody with sight, Maybe that's a good starting place for us to ask this question. Have you ever felt blind? Not physically blind, I don't mean, but blind. As in, you just didn't have this this sense of where life was taking you. You knew life was taking you somewhere, but you didn't know where that somewhere was. Right? You didn't have a good sense of direction. You didn't have a clear sense of where God was leading. You didn't have a defined sense of, of mission or, or purpose. That's a frustrating spot. How many have ever been there where you felt kind of directionally blind, confused? That's a frustrating spot. It's that sense that says, you know what? I've got to move. I sense that God's leading me to move. I've got to do something. I've got to make some kind of a change but I don't have any clue what that change is or where that move is to. I don't know what this is supposed to look like. In fact, Hebrews 11 actually describes Abraham that way. Hebrews 11:8 says this. It says, By faith, Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. Think about that. Think about what you know. We're not going to go to Genesis this morning, but Abraham, in Genesis, spends the first 70-plus years of his life living in his father's land. And then God says, it's time to go to this land I'm about to give you. And the Bible says that Abraham leaves his father's land to head on to this journey to eventually try and get to the promised land. 
Hebrews 11, 8 describes it by saying, he obeyed, he stepped out in faith blindly because he didn't know where he was going. Abraham has this sense that says, I can't stay here. I know I can't stay here. God's got something bigger for me, something better for me. He's doing something new, and I can't stay here in order to achieve that. So I got to move, but I don't know where I'm going. So I'm going to step out in faith, and I'm just going to trust that God is going to lead me to where I need to get. Some of us can relate to that here this morning, that you're here and you'd say, you know what? I don't know where I'm going. I don't know where I'm going in life. I don't know the direction that God has for me in life. What I do know is this. I can't stay here. I can't stay here any longer. I, I, I know that God is not calling me to stay in this pattern of life that I'm in, that it's just the, the day in, day out routine. God's not calling me to this. He's got something bigger, something better. I just don't know what it is yet. I know I can't stay where I'm at. Well, God, through the Holy Spirit, wants to direct you. He wants to direct you. He wants to be that guide in our state of directional blindness. He wants to lead you like that blind man. He wants you to rely on his vision. And so today and over the next few weeks, we're going to be looking at what it means to be spirit-led. And and we're going to be looking primarily at the life of a man named Philip out of Acts chapter 8. Now, Philip is an otherwise pretty ordinary guy. He's actually a lot like Abraham in that he couldn't really stay where he was. His circumstances dictated that he was going to have to move. And his success in that move was predicated upon the fact that he simply knew how to be led by the Spirit of God. So we're going to look at his story, at least in part here this morning. Acts chapter 8, if you have your Bibles. Acts chapter 8, starting in verse 1. It says, On that day a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem. And all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Godly men buried Stephen and mourned deeply for him, but Saul began to destroy the church. Going from house to house, he dragged off both men and women and put them in prison. So let me just pause and just give you a quick, quick refresher here. A few weeks back, we talked about Stephen. We talked about how he was the first martyr of the early church. He was stoned to death because he stood up to the Sadducees. And Stephen, before his death, had been appointed as one of seven men. The Bible talks about this in Acts chapter 6. He had been appointed as one of seven men whom the early church had had brought on onto their staff, in a sense, as administrators. And they had this, this job of basically properly distributing the funds and that were coming in and distributing the food and making sure that it was it was fairly being distributed to the to the people that were in need. And what this did is it freed up the 12 apostles, men like Peter, James, and John. It freed them up to focus on the things that they were called to focus on, which was was preaching the word and teaching the word and and prayer. Well, Philip was also, like Stephen, Stephen, one of those seven men. Okay, So there were seven guys that were appointed. And if you recall from a few weeks ago, we talked about this, Acts chapter 3, verse 6, characterizes those seven men this way. It says that they were men who were full of the Spirit and wisdom. And so what we just read a few moments ago was this, that on the very day that Stephen was murdered, this persecution breaks out against the church, and overnight the life of guys like Philip is instantly impacted. The Bible says that everyone but the apostles scattered. And the, and the intensity of this persecution begins to get ratcheted up. And anyone that's associated with Stephen or with, with his message, well, your life was pretty much at risk at this point. And so Philip certainly fit that qualification. He was, he was Stephen's direct colleague as one of the seven. And so what does Philip do? He splits town. He scatters along with the others. Verse 4 says, Those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. Philip went down to a city in Samaria and proclaimed the Messiah there. When the crowds heard Philip and saw the signs he performed, they all paid close attention to what he said. For with shrieks, impure spirits came out of many, and many who were paralyzed or lame were healed. So there was great joy in that city. Now over the next couple of weeks, what what I'd like to do is I'd like to make a case to you for the benefits of living a spirit-led life. And I'm not, actually, I'm going to give you five reasons. Now, today we're only going to get through one of those five reasons. So we're going to kind of be here for a couple of weeks. But I want to give you five reasons 
that you should desire to live a spirit-led life. Five reasons that you should not be content to live anything but a spirit-led life, that we should hunger for this, we should crave it, we should seek the Lord to live this, this way. And so we're, this is the why piece. This is why we're going to want to live a spirit-led life. After we kind of get through the why, we're, we'll get a little bit more into the how side of things. But why should I live spirit-led? And so the first reason, and really the only reason we're going to talk about today, is this, being led by the Spirit rebuilds shattered dreams okay rebuilds shattered dreams so i want to paint this picture for you right up until acts 758 where the bible says that talking about stephen they dragged him out of the city and began to stone him right up until that point things have been going really well for the early church really well i mean they have they have multiplied rapidly they have grown daily uh, the, the Bible says that they've done miraculous things. They've seen God do incredible, incredible things on their behalf. And any time that they have been met with resistance, as we've talked about this summer, the Bible says that, that God would give these men wisdom and he would, through his Holy Spirit, give them the words to stay and they would stand up to the people that were resisting them and, and they would have these, these really sharp answers for their accusers. In fact, the very fact that they had to bring guys like Philip on staff indicates how well it's going because now the apostles can't do it all themselves, right? These 12 guys say, we can't do this ourselves. We've got to bring some extra help on. And so they hire guys like Philip or bring guys like Philip into the leadership circle. That shows us the church is thriving. It's going really well, okay? And so now put yourself in Philip's shoes, Okay, you've just been selected very recently for this prestigious position, one of seven guys, right? I mean, this is a, this is a big deal if you're Philip because you've just observed over these last weeks and months that the name of Jesus has taken Jerusalem by storm, right? I mean, it's just, it's everywhere. People are getting saved left and right. And Philip has observed all this. And now the apostles come to him and they say, we want you to be one of our right-hand men. We want you to be a part of our leadership team. If I'm in Philip's shoes, at that moment, I'm thinking, this is awesome. This is cool. This is, there's this incredible move of God happening, and now I get to be a part of the story. right? I get to, to be a part of what's happening here. And so I imagine that Philip is looking at this, and he has got some dreams. He's got some hopes. He's got some vision. He's, maybe, maybe he's dreaming about how God is going to use him to reach his countrymen reach the Jewish population, and we're going to lead so many more people to Jesus. This is going to be awesome. Maybe he's, maybe he's praying, God, I, I would just pray that you'd use me to heal the sick and to, and to deliver those that are, uh, are oppressed and bound up by demonic influence. God, I want you to use my life in that way. He's dreaming this way. Maybe he's thinking, God, I want to do a great job in my role as an administrator. Lord, this is so cool. We get to feed the poor. This is going to be awesome, and we get to be a blessing to those that are in need. God, I pray that you'd use me in a powerful way. I can just see Philip and the excitement with this new position. And then Acts 7, 58 happens. And they drag Stephen out into the street and they stone him to death. And in an instant, everything changes. Everything changes. It's only weeks, maybe no more than a few months after he started his job, Stephen's killed. Persecution breaks out. And his dream is cut short. He goes from wanting to make a difference in Jerusalem to now just trying to preserve his life. Now just trying to make sure that he's not the next one arrested and killed. Have you ever been there? Maybe not the running for your life part, hopefully, but that place where the dream was shattered. The dream, you just, you had just, oh, you were invested in it. You were just excited. You believed it was going to be awesome. Everything in life was was sailing along smoothly. All was going according to plan. And then, boom, something happens. And the dream is shattered. You didn't see it coming. In an instant, it changes. I've been there. I have been there. And in that moment, let's face the facts here, in that moment that that dream is shattered, that's a painful place, isn't it? That's a painful place. It's a frustrating place. And usually when that happens, the last thing that we're really thinking about is the new opportunity or the potentially open door that's out in front of us. We're not thinking about that. We're thinking thinking about the good old days. 
We're thinking about the pain of watching that door close so, so unexpectedly and abruptly behind us. We feel like just sitting down with a gallon of ice cream and just grieving and feeling sorry for ourselves and just spooning it in. At least that's what I feel like doing. I don't know about you. Okay. And in that moment, we, we don't want to hear the cliche statements. We don't want to hear those things, you know, well, you know, whenever God closes one door, he opens another door. We don't want to hear that in that moment. Right? I mean, yeah, that's encouraging, but really in that moment, you're just feeling like, I just want my ice cream. I just want to, like, grieve. Don't tell me some cliche, but the thing is, is actually that's not cliche. That cliche is not cliche. Uh, that's straight out of the Word of God. That's God's truth. Revelation 3, 7 says this about Jesus. It says, describes him this way. It says, these are the words of him who is holy and true, who holds the key of David. What he opens, no one can shut, and what he shuts, no one can open. Do you know that cliche is not cliche? That is God's truth. There is nothing that will ever change that. Jesus truly is the door opener and the door closer. And so when the door to Philip's ministry in Jerusalem closes, Jesus wasn't surprised. He picks up the pieces of that, that shattered dream, and he begins to give Philip a new dream. He, he inspires Philip through the Holy Spirit, which we know the Bible says that Philip was a man filled with the Holy Spirit. Okay, and we, we know what Paul said, Romans 8, 14, that those that are led by the Spirit of God are the sons of God. So we know Philip is a man that's led by the Holy Spirit. So what does Jesus do? He begins to pick up the pieces of that shattered dream. He gives them a, a new inspiration, and he inspires them to go down to Samaria of all places. Now we're going to talk about this at, quite a bit at length la, uh, next week, so I don't want to go too far here. But you have to understand, this has to be Holy Spirit led for Philip to go down to Samaria. Okay? Because there is such a conflict between the Samaritans and the Jews. These groups do not like each other. And for Philip, as a Jew, to go to Samaria, this would be uh, tantamount to defiling himself. Even to walk into the land, he would be considered defiled as a Jew. They did not want anything to do with the Samaritans. So where does Philip go? He's on the run. He goes to Samaria. The, probably the last place in the world he really wants to go. And based upon the description that we just read a few minutes ago, where it said that when Philip got there, he, be, he was preaching the gospel and people were getting healed and, and demonic spirits were leaving with shrieks and all kinds of great stuff was happening in Samaria, I would say that just like that, Philip's ministry in Samaria was all the things he was probably hoping and dreaming it would be in Jerusalem. In fact, his ministry in Samaria was far more noteworthy than anything we ever are told that he ever did in Jerusalem. And I want you to hear this morning, friends, that, that the Spirit of God excels at rebuilding shattered dreams. He excels at rebuilding shattered dreams. And maybe you're here today, and, and you come holding in your hands the broken pieces of your dream. They're, just, they're scattered all around you. And I want you to hear this. Know this. Abraham, Joseph, David, Daniel, Elijah, Esther, Moses, Peter, so many others in, in, in Scripture, they can testify to this, that just when it looked like the dream was over, just when it looked like it was broken beyond repair, the presence of God restored the dream. He breathed life into something that looked like it was dead, looked irreparably broken. But all of those men and women had one thing in common, and it was this, they had a willingness to, to obey the leading of the Spirit of the Lord. There was a willingness to obey the leading of the Spirit of the Lord. As they followed his leading, usually at great personal risk, usually in a great display of faith, but as they followed his leading, God restored their dreams. And so this morning, if you come here and you feel like your dream's been shattered into a million, per, million pieces, I would say this. Start by trying to tune in to what the Spirit of God is saying. What is he saying about your situation? What is the Spirit of the Lord speaking over you? He wants to pick you up, not beat you up. Can I just say that? He wants to pick you up, not beat you up. In fact, if you're feeling discouragement, can I just tell you, this is something we learned in our Spirit Wars class, when you're feeling feelings of discouragement and, and, and depression, that's not from God. That's not the Holy Spirit. It might be some other spirit, it's not the Holy Spirit, okay? The Holy Spirit, he wants to pick you up 
not beat you up. He wants to build you up, not tear you down. Listen to his voice and he will lead you to greater things. Remember what Jeremiah 29, 11 says. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. Listen, if you're here this morning and you're in that place, you feel like the dream, whatever it was, is broken down. God wants to pick up the broken pieces of your life and put them back together. He loves to do it. Learn to follow his leading and you will not regret it. You say, well, okay, Pastor Ryan, but what about the, what about the person who, who got in the position of a broken dream by their own choices? I mean, they shattered their own dream. I mean, isn't it one thing for a guy like Philip? Philip didn't really do anything wrong, right? So, so we can understand how he might experience God's restoration of a dream. I mean, it's one thing for the person who, who you know, their dream was cut short because the company did mass layoffs and they just happened to get, kind of be a, a number and lost their job, and it was no fault of their own, and circumstances out of their control. Wasn't, wasn't Philip just a victim of, of unfair persecution? I mean, he hadn't actually done anything wrong. Stephen sort of opened that can of worms by standing up, and now he's sort of suffering the, the consequences of that. He unfairly had the dream shattered. Isn't that one thing for God, by his justice, to, to allow that to prevail and set the situation right? But what about the person who screwed this up for themselves? I mean, you're, you're, you're the person who, and, and I believe there's some of, some of us that would fit that description this morning, that you'd say, you know what, the dream is shattered, but I'm the one holding the hammer here. I'm the one that broke it. The answer, of course, is yes. The Spirit loves to restore the shattered dreams of those who even messed it up for themselves, who even broke down their own dream. Remember Samson? Remember Samson? I mean, this guy had it all. If you remember the story of Samson, good looks, supernatural strength, a position of leadership, the Spirit of God was strong on him, but what happened? He fell into a pattern of sin, and all that he had came crashing to the ground, right? All that he had came crashing to the ground. The Bible says in Judges 16 20 about Samson, it says, He did not know that the Lord had left him. One of the saddest statements in the Bible, actually did not know, didn't realize, didn't understand that the Lord had left him. He had foolishly allowed, if you recall, his hair to be cut. He had, he had played with fire in the form of Delilah one too many times, and he got burned in the worst way. He's captured by the Philistines. He has his eyes gouged out, and he's turned into a slave that the Philistines would bring out to, to, to mock him. They'd bring him out as entertainment. Samson had no one to blame but himself. He had it all everything going for him and he messed it up for himself but what did God do well look at Judges 16 25 with me and see what God did in Samson's life it says while they were still in while they were in high spirits they shouted bring out Samson to entertain us so they called Samson out of the prison and he performed for them when they stood him among the pillars Samson said to the servant who held his hand put me where I can feel the pillars that support the temple so that I may lean against them now the temple was crowded with men and women. All the rulers of the Philistines were there, and on the roof were about 3,000 men and women watching Samson perform. Then Samson prayed to the Lord, Sovereign Lord, remember me. Please, God, strengthen me just once more, and let me with one blow get revenge on the Philistines for my two eyes. Then Samson reached towards the two central pillars on which the temple stood, bracing himself against them, his right hand on one and his left hand on the other. Samson said, let me die with the Philistines. Then he pushed with all of his might, and down came the temple on the rulers and all the people in it. Thus, he killed many more when he died than when he lived. God redeems Samson's failure and uses him again one last time to achieve for Israel a great victory. It's the character of God that when, we, when our, our life has fallen down and it's broken, he graciously responds to our cries for forgiveness and mercy. That when we acknowledge our wrong, when we acknowledge our shortcoming, he loves to bring restoration and loves to use our lives again. It's the well-known story of the prodigal son. Luke chapter 15, the prodigal son, we, most of us probably know it well. Jesus tells this story. He says, there was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. 
Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. He had it all, didn't he? He had it all. He lived amongst a rich household, squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to the citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. This guy goes from like the palace to the gutter, and it's his own fault. It's his own greed. It's his own doing. He, he messed it up for himself. Verse 17, when he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? Here I am, starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. You know what I love about that story is this, is that the father, not only does the father forgive him, Right, this son that is unworthy, this son that messed it up for himself, the father, not only does he forgive him, but he restores him. Right, he puts the robe on him, he puts the ring. That ring was huge. That ring was the signet ring. That ring represented all of the authority, all of the representation of the father. That meant that that son with that ring, he could get into the same places the father could get into. He had the same kind of access that the father had, that he could be sent out as a representation of the father and do business, and he could stamp that signet ring, and it was just as if the father had done it. The father didn't look at the son and say, you know what? I'm going to forgive you, but boy, did you royally screw this up, and so I'm not going to trust you again. You really messed this up, kid, and no way am I going to give you any more of my inheritance. What does he do? He says, not only do I forgive you, but I restore you. I'm going to put you back in the position of authority that I've envisioned for you all along. Yeah, you messed it up. Yeah, you tripped over yourself royally, but you're home, and you're forgiven, and you're right back into the vision that I have for you. And you've got the same kind of authority that I've always envisioned for you. The same kind of access that I've always envisioned for you. I love that about the prodigal son. And this morning, God would say the same thing to you. That maybe you're here and you say, yeah, Pastor Ryan, I'm the one that really messed this up. But God says, not only do I want to forgive you for messing it up, but I want to restore you, and I want to bring that dream back to life. I want to pick up the broken pieces of that shattered dream and give you something fresh and new and exciting, like I did for Philip when his dreams were broken down so many years ago, and God did something new and fresh and exciting in his life in a land called Samaria, just like he did for the prodigal son, just like he did for Samson. In a book that's titled, No Wonder They Call Him the Savior, it's written by Max Lucado. Max Lucado tells this account, and it's reminiscent of the prodigal son. I'll just read it, and as I read it, the musicians can come, please. Max Lucado writes this. Longing to leave her poor Brazilian neighborhood, Christina wanted to see the world. Discontent with the home, having only a pallet on the floor, a wash basin, and a wood-burning stove, she dreamed of a better life in the city. So one morning she slipped away, breaking her mother's heart, knowing what life on the streets would be like for her young, attractive daughter, Maria, that's the mother, hurriedly packed to go find her. On her way to the bus stop, she entered a drugstore to get one last thing, pictures. She sat in the photograph booth, closed the curtain, and spent all she could on pictures of herself. With her purse full of small black and white photos, she boarded the next bus stop to Rio de Janeiro. Maria knew that Christina had no way of earning money. She also knew that her daughter was too stubborn to give up. When pride meets hunger, a human will do things that were before unthinkable. And knowing this, Maria began her search. Bars, hotels, nightclubs, 
any place with a reputation for street walkers or prostitutes. She went to them all, and at each place she left her picture, taped on a bathroom mirror, tacked to a hotel bulletin board, fastened to a corner phone booth. And on the back of the photo, she, of each photo, she wrote a note. It wasn't too long before both the money and the pictures ran out, and Maria had to go home. That weary mother wept as the bus began its long journey back to her small village. It was a few weeks later that young Christina descended the hotel stairs. Her young face was tired, her brown eyes no longer danced with youth, but spoke of pain and fear. Her laughter was broken. Her dream had become a nightmare. Thousand times over, she had longed to trade in those countless beds of prostitution for her secure home and that old, uncomfortable pallet. Yet the little village was in many ways too far away. As she reached the bottom of the stairs, her eyes noticed a familiar face. She looked again, and there on the lobby mirror was a small picture of her mother. Christina's eyes burned and her throat tightened. She walked across the room and removed that small photo. Written on the back was this compelling invitation. Whatever you've done, whatever you've become, doesn't matter. Please come home. And Max Lucado ends his story by saying just two words. She did. She did. This morning, maybe the dream has just been shattered. You set out with high hopes, believing it was going to be something great, inspired, excited, full of energy and enthusiasm. And somehow, some way along the way, it got off course. Maybe it was your own doing. Maybe it was your own choice, like the prodigal son or like this young lady, Christina. Maybe you are the one that broke that dream. You hold the hammer in your hand. Maybe it was not that. Maybe it was unforeseen circumstances. Maybe it was just things completely out of your control, but it happened nonetheless. And you see those pieces of your broken down dreams shattered around your feet and you've wondered, God, can you ever... Bring me back to that place where my life matters again. Where I feel that same kind of excitement and passion again. And this morning, I believe wholeheartedly the answer is yes. That if you will allow the Spirit of God, as we're talking about being Spirit-led, if you'll allow the Spirit of God to lead you and to guide you, and you'll learn to listen to His voice, He is going to lead you to places like He led that prodigal son to come home. He's going to lead you to places like he led Philip to a land that probably he didn't really want to go to, but that there awaited for him a powerful, powerful ministry. He's going to lead you if you listen to his voice. Remember, as a child of God, Romans says that we are to be led by the Spirit of God. That's the markings of the sons of God. God wants you to be Spirit-led. This morning, without anybody looking around, this is a, a two-part invitation this morning. Part number one. You'd say, you know what, Pastor Ryan? I'm here, and I'm probably most like that prodigal son or like that young lady, Christina, meaning I've just kind of messed this up for myself. And as step one, I just need to get right with God. I just need to repent. I just need to acknowledge that, that there's sin in my life and that God is calling me home and that that loving Father has run down the path to me, arms open wide, and He is ready to embrace me, and I'm going to accept that embrace. I want to rededicate my life to Jesus. Or maybe you've never made that step, and for the first time, you want to give your life to Jesus without anybody looking around. Would you just raise your hand this morning? I just, just want to pray with you quickly where you're at. Okay? Thank you. Anybody else that would slip up your hand this morning? Okay, several across this room. Okay, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Lord Jesus, I pray right now that for each one that's raised a hand, God, as in their heart, they just begin to confess. God, they just begin to confess as that prodigal son confessed, Lord, that they've fallen short, 
that they've messed up. God, I thank you. You're not going to beat them up. God, Holy Spirit, you don't beat them up. God, you're looking to build them up. God, and you're just going to begin to envelop them in your love and your forgiveness. God, I pray that they would begin to feel the forgiveness of Jesus Christ wash over them right now. God, and that all of that dirty, tarnished, tainted yuck of sin, God, that they would just begin to sense the guilt of that, just begin to wash clean. And God, that they would begin to see, sense that they're whole again, that they're in right standing with you again. In Jesus' name. Second part of this is this, though. The prodigal son didn't just get forgiven. God restored him. He restored him. And if you're here this morning, whether by your own doing or by circumstances out of your control, if you'd say, you know what, Pastor Ryan, somehow, some way, the dream that I had, the vision that I had, the plans that I know God had for me, they were good, they were exciting. I couldn't wait to get into them. They've been put to the wayside. They're up on the shelf. They're long forgotten about. It's broken down. I don't know if it's ever going to happen again, but Pastor Ryan, I want to dream again. I want to dream again. I want to, I want to be used by God again. I want to be like Philip, that, that there's another opportunity. I want to believe what Revelation says, that God, you're the one that opens the doors and closes the doors. And if you close that one, then God, I'm trusting you're going to open one. It's not a cliche. God, I want to believe that. God, I want to trust you, to lead me by your spirit into rebuilding a broken down dream. If that's you this morning, would you slip up your hand this morning? And I want to pray for you this morning. Hands going up all over this auditorium. Thank you, Lord. God, I thank you that you are in the restoration business. God, you are in the rebuilding business. Father, that you love to take the broken pieces of our life and build a beautiful, beautiful creation out of them. And so, Father, whatever it is that has caused these dreams to break down, circumstances perhaps out of their control, things that they've done, relationships that have broken down, maybe marriages that have ended, maybe job opportunities that the doors have closed, professional opportunities where the doors have closed, ministry opportunities where it feels like the doors have closed. God, I pray that, that this morning there would be a sense of rebuilding. God, that through your Holy Spirit, you would begin to build them up. God, begin to build them up. God, that they would begin to, to take stock, Lord, in what you've told us, Jeremiah 29, 11, that you've got plans to prosper us. God, that you've got a future for us. Thank you, Lord. God, may they walk out of here this morning empowered and invigorated to begin pursuing the dream again as your spirit leads them. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, I don't know about you, but I'd say this is a good start to us, the spirit-led series. Amen? I hope, I hope it's a good start. It feels like a good start to me. I'm going to tell you right now, you don't want to miss the next few weeks. If you've got plans to not be here, change your plans, okay? You want to be here because God's going to do some great stuff these next few weeks. Love you, church. Don't forget, sign up on your connection card for the things that are happening. Get water baptized. Hey, if you raised your hand this morning to make a recommitment, we'd love to see you get water baptized, okay, at our, submer at our uh, Praise in the Park event in a few weeks. So sign up. Have an awesome week, church. We'll look for you next Sunday.